begins with a personal view from Erin Pitsey and her thoughts on feminism and domestic violence. take you talking with me or would you rather not? No, you said that she's waiting for to come back from lunch. Can I ask you just a, this is a, a devil's advocate question, okay? The more I find out about what's happening between men and women in Britain today, the more worried I become. I remember this huge promise that there was going to be this new movement for women which was going to unite women and I thought it sounded absolutely wonderful the idea that women would work with each other instead of competing against each other. We were promised this bed of roses that all the magazines, all the advertisements, everything is geared towards this fantasy, this little cottage with roses around the door. I never really believed in that early 70s were all oppressed sort of feminism. I joined a feminist group looking for friendship, not revolution. Where did you put them? So I remember going to my first meeting and we walked into this big room and there were lots of Sherman Mao posters and women with guns in their hands, and liberation posters I subsequently found out. But they were very intimidating. And I'm looking at the other women who were also new like I was. And I remember she asked me why I'd come. And I said, well, I'd come because I was lonely and isolated and I'd hoped to meet other women who wanted to do something in our communities. And she found that really silly remark and she said very angrily to me that my problem was my husband and that he was oppressing me and that it was all linked to capitalism and I remember trying to argue and pointing out that I considered it a luxury to be able to stay home and look after my children that he paid the mortgage so I didn't see where he was oppressing me. The modern individual if she is a woman is cramped and stifled by the institution of the family as we know it. And um, I stood up and started arguing with them because one of the things that they were planning was the total destruction of the family. I don't think anybody does really like how they are living, especially women. And I kept saying, but I believe passionately in family life. I don't understand. If you want a movement that's dedicated to hating men, then I don't want to be part of it. And to cut a long story short, I was thrown out and barred from all their collectives. And my group, the Goldhawk Road group that messed my house, was disbanded and I went off to do what I really believed in. It's hard to categorize my first dress to some, those in authority, she's a pain in the rump. To many others, she's a crusader, a champion of the underprivileged, a saint even. In 1971, she founded the Chiswick Women's Aid, the first ever refuge for battered wives and their children. The woman who started it all, Erin Pitsy. From housewife to chat shows in one short leap. Actually, I was only there because someone dropped out at the last minute. But for a few short years, I was the person who got phoned whenever a comment on feminism, family breakdown, or especially domestic violence was called for. Well, I think the thing that these things contributed to violence is the breakdown of family life. Uh, time and time again, you have to explain that the, with the work at Chiswick, we don't just look after women and kids, we also look after men. Now, those are the front door steps of Chiswick, and that's one of the mothers furiously sweeping because actually trying to keep that house clean with sometimes as much as a hundred mothers and children in it was an absolute nightmare and it was amazing how clean we managed to keep it but it literally meant we had about four lavatories for all those people and a couple of showers and a bath and we had to feed the children as you can see in by rota and we had big families lots of mothers had five or six children and they answered the phones and they kept the diaries of what was happening and all the appointments that we had. And they voted who could come in to see them and who they didn't want to see. Every time I drive past it now, I have this really sad feeling. I'm 39 now, I'm nearly 60 now. And there's the same cross and the same bracelets. There's even a suggestion of it. Because if you look at this place, no one would come here unless they were in fear of their lives or they were in such deep trouble themselves that they badly need help. That house was packed, this little tiny house, and then I went downstairs, there's no knocking on the door, 
I opened the door and there was this woman and she was from Southampton and she was lovely, she had long blonde hair and she was carrying a baby and a child holding onto her skirt. I looked at her and said, where have you come from? She said, I've come from Southampton. I just said, well, how did you know about us? She just said, I heard. And then I realized that this is going to be absolutely enormous and swampy. I began to realize that I was dealing with two very different things. One of the things I was dealing with immediately was women who were innocent victims of their partner's violence. They were indeed battered women. And they were very easy to, to, to rescue from those relationships because they wanted to get out. They recognized it was dangerous and they couldn't do anything about it. But the women that I mostly recognized needed extra help were the women who were victims of their own violent relationships. When you looked at their childhoods, they had been abused as child children, they'd been abandoned, betrayed. Some of the women coming in were prostitutes. They were not battered women, innocent victims. They had their own agendas and their own problems that needed dealing with because what I realized very quickly is if they didn't receive help, they would either go back to the very abusive relationship or they would go on to make further violent relationships. I wrote a book saying exactly what I'd come to believe. As far as the feminists were concerned, I had become a vicious, woman-hating traitor to the cause. After facing death threats and personal abuse, I finally fled the country with my young family. One of the reasons we had to leave England, if you remember, when, the, when you had to, you were the one, I had to call the bomb squad. Oh, that time, yeah. The time yeah. we were on the doorstep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In fact, what I realised after that, because you were just tiny, and I was standing in this room with the bomb squad, and they'd come in, and it was, was very it, frightening. What was it main? What's the main? Well, the, 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 what happened is that the police had said anything that came to my house that wasn't properly stamped or had any kind of address thing on it, you know, you yeah, see, it, might be. It, could, it could possibly be a bond to harm us. Mm. So they said then you, we'd have to telephone. So obviously I told Clear, and you were very little. So she telephoned me and said, you know, that there was this thing, that the parcel had come, and that she put it out in the back garden on the ping pong table. So I came home, mm. and the bomb squad already arrived. Mm. And, um, and there was this nasty moment when I was looking through the window, being quite interested, and I looked over my shoulder, and all the bomb squad were up that end. <laughs> and I realised that it was just really quite dangerous. Mm. And I thought, we can't go on living like this as a family. Yeah. Death threats over the telephone. I'm not surprised after reading Point of Violence, I mean, because it's... What it said, and you know, so significant, but mm. so difficult for people to hear. Well, but not the general public. It was just, it was just really the ideologues. You know, the women who decided to make this movement mm. to end up making all their money <coughs> out of a cause which hated men. Mm. And I wasn't saying anything terribly complicated. I was just saying, yeah, well, both men and women can be violent, and that's what they wouldn't accept. Mm. Fifteen years later, I came home to find nothing had changed. The message was still the same. Men are batterers and women are victims. Men are the problem. One in four women abused, say the headlines. A quarter of all women battered at home. Violence is destroying the lives of one in four women. government is said to be declaring war on violent fathers and our children are told to report their families because they think it's all about big bad dads. The anti-man climate was turned even colder in Scotland during the Christmas holiday this year when a campaign costing over £600,000 of taxpayers' money revealed to Scottish women and children the government's view of their lives. It's Friday. You know I go out with the boys on a Friday. I just couldn't get away at lunchtime. I was so sorry. The boys are backing me. I've been knocking my pan in. All day! And you can't even make the tea! Call yourself a mother! A recent survey suggests one in five women in Scotland live with a constant threat of domestic abuse. Well, I don't believe it. I wanted to understand the thinking that lies behind this view of family life. So I spoke to the people who'd organised the campaign for the government. You know, the campaign was aimed at 
changing public opinion because the one thing we do know from all the research mm. and all the experts we spoke about that our plan with was that if we made a direct appeal to those that perpetrate the abuse and the violence mm. saying, please don't beat up your partner, mm. then it would be ignored. People don't recognize themselves in that kind of communication. <laughs> those on the receiving end tend not to recognize themselves either. I just couldn't get away at lunchtime. Mm. You put a scenario up and you put a face up. What was the advice you got about women being violent to men? We spoke to the police about that. And Did they give you a statistic? We were told, uh, one police expert told us it's about 97% is... Always men. ...is men on women rather than the other way around. So there Gosh, is a, 97%. I hate the prevailing climate that men are devils and women are angels. I don't believe it. And many people don't believe it either, but they're afraid of speaking out because of the consequences. I went to see a neuroscientist at a London teaching hospital who looked at male violence from a physiological point of view and had felt prompted to do wider research on the domestic violence issue, Dr. Malcolm George. I noticed a difference between what I was studying as a neuroscientist and the domestic violence issue. The, the two didn't somehow quite match up. Well, can you work out then, because I often get asked about the one in four. One in four women are supposed to be battered. Now, how did they ever get there? Yes, the problem with these kind of figures is, is that they tend to get produced in small, localised studies in which one really doesn't know what the population base is. It, it, the demography of it is, is uncertain. Okay, um, this morning, this lecture is perhaps a little different. Um, figures like one in four or one in five women having suffered a physical assault have been arrived at through looking at particular samples of women. It is certainly possible, and I, in my own research, have found a subgroup of women where the instance of sustaining assault from any male partner was of the order of one in five. But that was not the picture for all women. The problem with this kind of research is that it's done from a preconceived point of view, i.e. that men are the perpetrators and women are the victims, mm. and then progresses from there to try and prove the case. Mm. So it's not surprising in some senses that you get these inflated figures because one is trying to prove a preconceived case. Mm. Um, but it's fundamentally flawed and in fact quite disreputable. Of course, if you do surveys that only ask women about their experience of domestic violence, you will automatically find that the results will show a bias against their partners, i.e. men. I'm not for a moment suggesting that there aren't any vicious or violent men. I've probably known many more than the feminist theorists, because I've had years of helping people like Jeannie and Maureen. These are women who really know about domestic violence. They've been through it themselves. When I went in, you give me a big hug. <laughs> and that was the first time for years anybody had actually hugged me. Yeah. You didn't move off the sofa for two weeks. You had to no, one no. under each arm. Oh, right. I got there late at night and there was two ladies sitting on the doorstep waiting for me. Yeah. 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 And then when you walk in a room like that and you see there's people with their black eyes yeah. and all that sort of thing. Or what you yeah, think it's the only person. When you're at home and, and drive through it, you think you're the only one, don't you? Yeah. But Jeannie and Maureen also saw that not all the women were simply angelic victims. No, I'm afraid none of her daughters are either. She was the one who mm. got off because she cut the husband's phone. On the day he was beating hell out of her, wasn't he? And she cut his throat. No, that was that. No, it, it, was, it was supposed to be self-defense, remember? Yeah. And he, she got him with a crotted artery. That's fine, yeah. yeah. Hello, can I speak to Professor John Archer, please? I soon realized that overall women were slightly more likely to be physically aggressive to their partner than vice versa. Now, of course, this is uh, a great surprise. John Archer is a psychologist who has reviewed all the available studies of domestic violence right across the world that looked at the behavior of both men and women. The idea that it's all men battering women is simply false. So we simply said of those who got injured, uh, what percentage were women? Okay, it would be sort of 95 to 100 percent 
if the um, feminist researchers are correct and it really isn't a, a, a problem or, or men being injured isn't really a problem. But what we found was that overall it was about 65%. So it is true that uh, of those who are injured, the majority are women. But there's a substantial minority of up to a, uh, an over a third who are men. So we concluded in, in the end that there was a significant minority of men who got injured by their partners and got injured by their partners enough to have medical treatment. I'd written a newspaper article saying I thought the feminist climate was intimidating people from telling the truth about domestic violence. A social worker from Wales had seen it and we began to talk. Not only the people who speak to us, but the people who can't speak to us and seem frightened to speak to us. In fact, they say they're frightened to speak to us. What do you think's created this climate of intimidation? Well, I think within my own profession of social work, within the, within the training, uh, there is a dominant ideology uh, of feminism, uh. which is deeply prejudiced against men. Uh. Um, and, um, and does plant the seeds of the climate of fear right from the very training. Uh. So as social workers go from uh, doing the uh, diploma as it is now, uh. Uh, they bring that ideology out into their work. And um, it, it obviously comes through into the profession, it comes through into procedures, and I even see it in the courts. There's uh. a definite prejudice uh, against men, against fathers. So I went to see him. He and a colleague described to me the outcome of this pervasive prejudice against men. The social workers working with unhappy families automatically tend to assume that the man is the problem and that removing the father is the solution. Why I was excited by, by your article is that it seemed to be the, the, the first, uh, a first ever sign that, that men should start fighting back against this um, almost prevailing philosophy now that, that men, that fathers, are expendable components of mm. family life, which is mm. absolutely wrong. And that isn't me saying that as a, as a social work manager, that's children saying that day in, day out. Mm. You can't stop kids missing their fathers. Mm. It seems to be um, something for years that's been unacceptable that you, know, you get violence from men, you get violence from women, you get violence from older children towards their parents yeah. as well. Mm. But that doesn't mean to say they, they don't want to see each other again, or even live with each other. Well, they're more likely to want to see each other than families when there's no violence. Yeah, they, That's something you've really got to learn. They want to work with each other. Yeah. They want to work with they're each other. They're very passionate, those relationships. Oh, no, they're very intimate. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, they're very defensive. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Very loyal. But, but, you know, if you take the, the, the cat and dog relationship, mm. the Jack and Vera, for want of mm. another word, they're, 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 they're arguing. Not necessarily the violence, it's very intimate. Mm -hmm. and, and they will slag each other off to the end, but try and, uh, try and slag one of them off yourself, and you'll get shut out. Yeah. And to some extent, that will happen in violent relationships. Mm. They can be violent to each other, but anyone else comes in, they're excluded, which makes it then very difficult to get in. But the prevailing philosophy, which I, I see um, being used in much of uh, domestic violence now, is, is leading us down a blind alley mm. because it's leading us down an alley which excludes men from family life. There's no future down there. A significant proportion of women go into refuges and come out and go back to the violent partner. Yeah. Mm. Surely they're telling us that they want to be worked with as a family. Mm. They want to be worked with as a couple, mm. but we don't listen to that. Well, the, one of the problems I see, sort of, when I'm working with relationships, is is where there has been an abusive relationship or someone's been abused. There's no work done on the relationship. Mm. There may be work being done on both individuals, particularly women who, who will receive some f uh, form of counselling, and men who uh, uh, form have some form of counselling, but what's not ha happening is that they're not working together, they've been isolated from each other. Violence is wrong, it's a crime, it shouldn't happen, but it's, t it's focusing on the violence and not on the, the demon man, mm. you know, and, and, and the, the, the angel woman who is mm. never violent, which mm. they're both myths, mm. you know, no. violence exists. In, in all aspects of mm. family life. Mm. As many of the women are as violent, it's just never talked about. That's right, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot of women who, who almost incite violence by violence. And, yes, and, uh, they're what I call violence-prone women. I think men themselves need a, uh, a bit of a kick up the backside to go out there and say, look, this is, and start fighting back, doing their own research, saying that radical feminism is wrong, saying that, and this has got to be, I think, one of the first steps, saying 
violence is wrong, it can't be accepted, but women do it, men do it, children do it to their parents, and we've got to work at stopping violence and not demonising men. Mm. Uh, mm. That's got to be, I think, a, a first thing. So how did we get ourselves into this mess, with nobody really prepared to speak out for fear of being seen as reactionary women haters? I think the answer is that the early anti-male feminism I saw all those years ago has become the norm for a generation of politicians and academics. This is The Family Way. It was written ten years ago by Anna Coote, Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt. I asked them to appear on this programme, but they declined. I think it's typical of the sort of thinking about family life that is now reflected in government policy. They rather patronisingly agree that it's important for fathers to form strong, loving bonds with their family. But they seem to think that this is not something that men do naturally. On page 25, most domestic violence and child sexual abuse is perpetrated by married men against their own wives and children. I think that's been proved false. Page 31. Many boys observe or experience the violent and brutal behaviour of their own fathers and learn accordingly how to be men. Page 26. It cannot therefore be assumed that men are bound to be an asset to family life or that the presence of fathers in families is necessarily a means to social harmony. The authors don't seem to think that men are a necessary part of family life and that bothers me. Well, I think from the early days, from when I was actually in Belmont Terrace, the little house, I recognised that as soon as we attracted public funding and immediate attention, that the danger would be that the feminist movement, who were looking for a cause and were also looking for funding, would come and invade and hi to try and hijack the whole problem, the whole subject, actually, which they did. And there was no way I could stop them. Because apart from anything else, as far as the general public were concerned, the feminist movement was seen really as something that was really quite it was radical chic, it was funny, it filled up media stories, and it made men laugh. But nobody took the threat seriously. And nobody understood that what had been seen as equity feminist, women asking for equality with men, had been superseded by a much more powerful movement of women who were gender feminists, who were avowed women who vowed and hated men. And I'd seen those women in the, in the collectives, the early collectives. In this country, there's a rather ignoble tradition of um, top-down social reformers. That is to say, people, and they've generally been women mm -hmm. in the upper middle class or upper classes, who preach to the lower orders um, about how the lower orders should be behaving. And I think we see this in contemporary feminism. Contemporary feminism in its hard-edged uh, form that we've been talking about the sense in which um, uh, uh, the, there's been a sort of long march through the institutions of what I would call Marxist feminists. Um, that type of person generally is upper middle class. They're career women. They're generally very well educated. They're quite often well off or relatively well off. Um, they're usually women who are very assertive. They're women who usually can afford um, very good child care and who basically can't imagine how anyone can not be like them. And I think that's one of the most obnoxious features of contemporary feminism, that it is um, a, a deeply patronizing, uh, uh, class-based um, ideology, uh, which um, has succeeded in large measure because it is uh, embodied by uh, women who are in positions of great power in our culture. That culture seems to contemplate families without men. Patricia Morgan blames feminist thinking. What began as this countercultural explosion in the 60s and this particular form of Marxist feminism mm. which emerged from that, that it, it generated this anti-family movement and the practitioners of that have gone through the academic, um, they're in the academic world and they're in the, the higher echelons of political world. Now, on the one hand, there was all this sort of idea that family breakup didn't hurt children, but what lay behind that was the feminist idea that the family was the source of tyranny, the family was the source of um, hardship and hurt, uh, and that the nuclear family was a source of repression for children and for women, mm -hmm. and that therefore there was some sort of uh, desirability about breaking up the family. This is repeated so many times. 
that the family is the center of abuse. You find that, that overwhelmingly and disproportionately the abuse of children is by step-parents, particularly the mother's boyfriend, mm. or again, if there is a lone parent, this, the family is often open to predation from outside. Well, and the children are relatively mothers. supervised, and of course the mothers themselves. Mm. A large amount of the physical abuse of children, the neglect of children, is from mothers, mm. and particularly mothers who are lone parents. Mm. I'm just looking at this Home Office report, and it came out this week, um, almost the last week in January, and it's called Domestic Violence Breaking the Chain. And what's so spectacular about it, and so amazing, is about the first time in 25 years, it says domestic violence is controlling behaviour and includes all kinds of physical, sexual and emotional abuse within all kinds of intimate relationships. It harms women and men. It wrecks thousands of lives. There's a new research on domestic violence, and it says that equal numbers of men and women, 4.2%, said they had been physically assaulted by a current or former partner. For me, it's a kind of miracle, after 25 years of feeling very alone, recognizing because of the work I was doing that both men and women batter and assault and torment and torture each other and the tragedy over the last 25 years is that the feminist movement was allowed to say anything they liked, to throw figures wrong, around that were wrong to accuse men of all sorts of bad behavior to try and destroy marriage and family life and now after all this time the curtains are beginning to open and we're going to realize that it was a big lie and that many people's lives, particularly men, have been destroyed by this huge lie. And now you think to yourself and, and believe, finally, that things are going to change, that it is going to be justice for men, women and children. The idea of sisterhood was powerful, if you remember. That was the big slogan. And I thought that meant that we were going to put down all our weapons and actually cooperate <laughs> and network and do it. And in fact, what we found is that we just got oppressed by another set of oppressors called you other women. Called other women. <laughs> yes. And now they're all... But you see, you can't... You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't hope to be approved of. I mean, you can't hope to be right and approved of. If you're right, everybody's going to hate you. And I think it's just one of the rules, you know. And you have to put up with martyrdom. I mean, you can't, well, you know, you, you, you find followers and they follow you and then you die and they all realize you're right. Yeah, you know, it's a big deal. But you want it to happen now and with all the sort of means of communication, I hope, you know, I, I, I hope that it will. And you, you may, you know, you, you know, you were, if you like, silenced for a bit. For me, it's well, for, yeah, yeah, well, I mean, you know, that's a bit, um... <laughs> <laughs> fairly hard to live through and, and then come back I mean, and, you, and you look at the world as it is now and you talk about it and you're absolutely completely right what is going on is, is monstrous we've got to stop singling men out as the enemy of the family stop demonising them as oppressors of weak and incapable women if we don't feminist thinking will go on ruining families have any program ideas for Counterblast, please write to the Community Program Unit at this address or send an email 